Okay, a uh, little more about background, general data, and purpose. Some of these things I'm repeating for purpose, so you have just good notes and a good introduction before we jump into chapter one. Um, again, background, the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans uh, is his most extensive theological epistle, and as such, really um, a masterpiece of antiquity. Uh, Pauline, when we say Pauline, we refer to to letters or epistles penned down by Paul. So when we say Pauline authorship for Romans, it means Paul. Uh, just a scholarly way of saying it. So um, his authorship is accepted by almost all biblical scholars. And uh, the, the, the date is uh, generally agreed upon as, as falling somewhere around uh, A.D. 57, I go with fall 57, uh, some three years prior to Paul's arrival in Rome. Remember, he got there in 60 A.D. Uh, again, Paul probably authored this letter from Corinth during his third missionary journey. And um, the Christian woman by the name of Phoebe, uh, P-H-O-E-B-E, -E, is the one who delivered the letter to the church at Rome. The Jewish Christian audience uh, at Rome was for sure an energetic and growing, a bustling body of believers. Uh, again, we're not certain how exactly the church was birthed, as I said earlier, um, but we do know that the first Christians in the region were expelled because of the persecution by Claudius. Uh, and then in time, a mixture of Christian Jews and Gentiles were reestablished, and it was to this second established body of believers, some believe, that Paul was addressing. Um, Paul emphasized, again, harmony and unity in Romans, reminding the Jews and the Gentiles alike that they were both under the bondage of sin, having missed the mark of perfection or intentionally hitting the mark of imperfection. And, of course, they're freed from that bondage by grace through, through faith. Uh, we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. That's also a phrase we have in Paul. Uh, Paul was careful, though, to remind the Gentile believers that the Jews had not ceased to be God's chosen people, uh, but was equally careful to remind the Jews not to rely on their ethnic ethnicity for salvation. In other words, just because I'm born Jewish doesn't mean my, uh, I'm, I'm saved. Just because I'm born American doesn't mean I'm saved, or in Sweden, or wherever. Uh, some people are under that impression. Um, Paul also included practical and everyday instructions on Jews and Gentiles living together in peace, that unity. Uh, when we get to Romans 9, 10, and 11, we will explore a doctrine and known as uh, replacement theology. Uh, that's what they call it today, which is the idea that the church has replaced Israel, all of the Old Testament promises made in the Tanakh to the Jews, to the Hebrews, are somehow now transferred to the church, where the church is considered um, being the new Israel. We are, it's claimed that we are spiritually Jews. We are spiritual Israel. I don't go with that view. And it depends who you read, uh, and uh, it would be it uh, covenant theologians and so forth, um, even some of the church fathers, uh, majority of them went with that view. And we must remember that theologians err. They make mistakes. The, the, the Word of God doesn't. The, the, the promises made to the Jews in the Old Testament, to the Hebrews, the ancient Israelites, are not conditional. It's not. Malachi 3.6 says, I, the Lord thy God, I do not change. So he's immutable, unchanging. Uh, that's his very nature. So he can't lie. He can't go back on his word, regardless of, of, of the Hebrews' imperfections in the past. Um, imagine if God were to just uh, uh, pull back his plan of redemption from you because of your imperfection and my imperfection. We strive to be Christ-like. We're still stuck in this body and it's not always easy. Uh, why should we write off the Jews? Um, also, historically, we must remember that the early church was predominantly Jewish. It wasn't all of Israel that rejected Jesus or Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel and the world. Uh, so my view is when you get to the church fathers, you see a very Gentile theology. Got to remember the first Jewish bishops in Jerusalem following James, who headed up the Jerusalem church. James, uh, after him, I think we had a succession of about 
some 9 to 11 generations of Jewish bishops ruling at the um, Jerusalem church that uh, was started up by, uh, or, or that James himself, the half-brother of Jesus, headed up. So in my view, replacement theology or ancient supersessionism is a very Gentile belief. So we will be dealing with that as well. So that is a side note. Uh, Paul was careful to remind the Gentiles that the Jews had not ceased to be God's chosen people, but were equally careful to remind the Jews not to rely on their ethnicity in order to be saved. Um, the Jewish Christians um, uh, were mixed again with the Gentiles in Rome. We went over that. As for the purpose of the book, the history of the church at Rome uh, raised special problems for Paul to address in the letter. And you see that. Um, because he's addressing not just Jews but Gentiles, and it's a, it's a, it's a letter that's being written and hand-delivered to the church at Rome, um, you know, you can just see that um, Paul had some issues uh, probably pending down the letter. Thank God he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so all of it came across fine. But the formation of the church at Rome uh, probably came, again, from those who had been converted under the preaching of Peter, at Pentecost, who then returned to Joe, to uh, to Rome. So, having said that, if there were any other Jews that left Jerusalem and headed for Rome, maybe Paul would have known some of these fellows. Uh, maybe they would have known that he studied under Gamaliel in Jerusalem, and uh, his connections with the Sanhedrin, which was the equivalent of the the, the Supreme Court here in the United States. Um, on a different note, I'm trying to really wrap up the introduction here so we can get into the, uh, the bread and the butter. Um, in Romans, we also see Paul seeking to highlight the need to share what this believing body had in common. That's The idea there is that they are one in Christ Jesus, just like all believers. I don't care if you are uh, a born-again Catholic, a born-again Greek Orthodox, a uh, Protestant. We are all one in Christ, and as long as we agree on the essentials, that's what we considered Christianity, or that's what we consider salvific Christianity. Uh, Paul's main theme is that all people are sinful and consequently in need of redemption. This salvation can only be provided or obtained by the one true God who is Lord over both Jew and Gentile, and that um, salvation can only be obtained through the work of Christ. Remember John 14:6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So um, it is a very exclusive message as such. And as a side note, I do want to mention this. Religious pluralism is rampant today. Uh, they argue that all religions are salvific, or it doesn't matter what religion you believe in, they're all adequate means of salvation. Uh, I got news for those folks. Religious pluralism is exclusive. Exclusivism would be Christianity. I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, who's Christ, right? You can only obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. And that's a very narrow message the world screams at us. Keep this in mind. Buddhism, uh, most strands of Hinduism, uh, Islam, including cults, all claim to be the only way. So every religion is exclusive. So when the religious pluralist says, all of them are equal means. What they're doing is they're going against every single individual religion on the face of the earth. So that's number one. Number two, the religious pluralist is really also preaching a message of exclusivism. Keep this in mind here. The religious pluralist, like John Hick, for example, will, will say that uh, they, they, they pose to be so inclusive of, of all the world religions but in the name of pluralism and being so inclusive of all, guess who they exclude? The exclusivists. So in the name of pluralism, they include all except for evangelical Christianity or any strand of Christianity that claims to be the only way. And that is, uh, of course, unfortunate. So as such, religious pluralism is really uh, pluralistic exclusivism at best. Um, so we see um, that there's quite a bit of doctrine in the book. I'm reading my notes as I'm speaking to you. Um, this is new to me, too. I'm used to live lectures. But um, 
Paul's main theme is, again, that all of us are sinful. We're in need of sal salvation. As far as the theology, this work of Paul is undoubtedly one of the greatest and early systematic pieces of the uh, mid-first century, uh, and by far his most doctrinal book. Various church fathers and early apologists, including Augustine, all the way up to Martin Luther, have um, considered this epistle uh, to the Romans a literal jewel. We're going to stop there for our introduction, and uh, we'll be back with Romans 1. <laughs>